Hello and welcome to the Mal and Johnny Show. Our very special guest today is Elio Pace. He's currently on tour with the Billy Joel Songbook and he's coming to Cardiff this Friday at the New Theatre. Before we speak to the man himself, let's see him in action. So Elio, you're coming to Cardiff uh, on Friday, and this is the last date in in this actual tour, which has been a nightmare, I suppose, with COVID. Well, it, it has, and I'm so looking forward to coming to Cardiff. I've played in South Wales many, many times in my life. Once, actually, as piano player for Shaking Stevens, which was <laughs> at, at Saint Saint David's Hall in Cardiff. Oh my God, that was a great, great night. Um, uh, it's, and actually, my my girlfriend's family are from uh, Llanethly as right. well. So, um, oh. you know, there's you a lot say of... it properly as well. Which is well, good. <laughs> she's taught me, Johnny. She's taught me to say it. So this Friday, oh, my gosh, I can't tell you. I am so excited, especially that you guys have done me so proud again, because I think there's about 40 tickets left yeah. there at the new theatre. Oh, fantastic. And I've, I've seen yeah. some of the responses of the of the previous five dates, and it's it's been astounding. It's been astounding. So we'll come back to the show in a minute. But yeah. I, let's can we go back? Because we've got, we've got a little bit of time to, to, to share, yeah. if that's all right. Yeah. I mean, what a great name. Johnny and I were talking about it before we started. Elio Pace. I mean, what's your real name? Do you know what? You're not the first person to, to ask me that question. Is that your real name? Is your, is your name Bob something? Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is, it, is it Steve? It's actually Italian. And my mum and dad are both... My dad is from the centre of Naples, Benevento in Napoli. Wow. And my mum is from Lago Negro, which is about an hour and a half even further south, famous for being the place where Lisa Ghiradalli, who's the woman, the Mona Lisa. Right. She's She was born in my mum's town in Lago Negro. Oh. Obviously, you know, 150, 200 <laughs> years earlier, but, um, or whenever it was. Yeah. Um, uh, it's Elio Pace. That's Pace. how I was christened. Elio Pace. Pace. Lovely. I, Lovely. Did, Pace. I, did, I did gigs in Naples, in the, in the NATO base. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, when all, we used to do all the American bases in Germany, and they sent me down to Naples to do the NATO base, which was great. Yeah, and then I, I, then I then I had to do another gig called the Bluebird Club, which was on the pier head, which is all sailors, which is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So what year was this? Johnny? Oh, you're going. Well, it was when the... Mona Lisa was born. It was the year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not quite that far back. I think it was something like 1969 or something. Okay, now how did you, back. how did you find Naples? Or, uh, as long as you got your hands in your pocket, nobody's going to rip you off. You're <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> Uh, my my dad my dad uh, was brought up in Naples and it wasn't an easy upbringing in mm. back in the in the forties and mm. the early fifties mm. yeah. and my dad said listen he said I I want a better life than this you know my dad always said that if he'd stayed in Naples he would have been either in prison or dead <laughs> um, so he literally said yeah. uh, no let's go so they got married in Tuscany actually the oh. family moved to Tuscany and then in the early sixties they emigrated and made uh, Britain their home. And I was born here. Yeah. So uh, so I have the best of both. You know? and, and a lot of music yeah. in the house? or, or... Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, Vedo mare quante belle, spiro tanto sentimento, di ma me che tiene a mente, casperudo vai sonna. All of these beautiful Neapolitan songs, yeah. mum and dad would be making the, the yeah. pasta, both of them cooking in the kitchen yeah. and... The front door was always open. There were people always turning up for dinner. Yeah. Ah, come and sit down. I made some. We made some. You want some pasta? You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it was like that. Birthdays, christenings, uh, Easter, Christmas. Yeah. It, there was always music in the house. And always so, El- well, Elio, come house. on, come Elio, do a song. Come on, Elio, do a. Song. Was it like that? Yeah, I mean, that, that, perform- oh, that's exactly Elio. Elio, come on. Come on, do, do do some Elvis. You know, oh, well, it's the one for the money, a two for the... Okay. And then mum would sing, you know, Oi vita, vita mia, o core, who kiss to core. Really beautiful melodies you know that what? I grew the up The Italian listening. songs, I mean, they, they yes. translated loads of them. They got fantastic melody. Yeah. And you remember I went to the gig Monte Carlo and I had to sing an Italian song. Which one? Uh, Alla vita, it was called. Which is, this is my life. Ah, la vita, più bello della vita. Non c'è niente, that one. 
And, You've um, got an amazing accent. Let's talk about say, Michael and Ethley. That I was an amazing you, Italian accent. I'm going to tell you a lovely story. The woman down the road from Sicily, she taught me the song. And when I'm singing, the waiter said, are you from Sicily? Because <laughs> 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 I must have copied the way she said, said it. It's perfect. You're, but I've got to say, there's something about the Welsh mm. and the Italians. There's something in the language or something in the way we place our tongues. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's a sound. It's yeah. very similar. The yeah. vibrato, the, the sonorous sound of the Welsh singing and the Italian, it's very, very closely linked, I think. Yeah. Now yes. then, play, playing the piano, because we've seen you playing the piano in that little introduction. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but you've, you learned, you know, you're not a bluffer like me. You went to college. You went to Leeds, which is, which is a great college for jazz and all that sort of thing. Is that the sort of music that you went to study? Well, I went there because I was never going to be a classical musician and I wanted to further my ed my education, but there was nothing much. There was Middlesex Polytechnic that, oh, that did yes. a light music yeah, course. Yeah. That doesn't even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so it was Leeds. I said, people said to me, listen, Leeds do a jazz course. They mm -hmm. teach you how to arrange, how to write um, harmonies and, and, you know, you get sick. So I went there. Now, truth be told, I didn't really take to it mm. the only thing there was a couple of things that made me stay for the two of the three years and that was my singing teacher Val Bollard I'd never had a singing lesson in my life when I walked into my first lesson she uh, the, the, the the brief was when you go to your first lesson this week bring a song that you would like to work on I bought with me I'll never fall in love again by Tom Jones right <laughs> Which has that beautiful top A, fall yeah. in love, I get that, yeah. which she said, okay, come in. Now, this was a fantastic, she's an Opera North singer and she was a brilliant teacher and she clocked straight away that I was going to be spending most of my life at the piano. She said, right, come and sit down at the piano. I will, I will do everything I need to do with your back and your shoulders are down and, and your breathing all from the piano. So I started to sing uh, I'll Never Fall In Love and I went for that top A and she screeched, she went, stop, stop. You're going to kill yourself singing like that. She said, right, come and sit down. And she did all this pushing and pulling for half an hour. I said, now think about this, think about that, do this, do this. And then she went, now try it again. And at the end of the lesson, I went for that fall in love, fall in love, that top A. And I nearly cried and I nearly fell over backwards. With I'd never had so much air yeah. passing through my lungs as she had taught me in half yeah. an hour through the diaphragm that yeah she's yeah. exactly the diaphragm holding it yeah. down feeling like you're pushing i'd never had any of this she changed my life and she completely gave me my singing career Isn't i believe brilliant? and i had two great years with her and the other thing that was amazing was learning to write arrangements. There was a great teacher, Bill Kinghorn uh, and Bill Charlson there, who taught me to write orchestrations for mm. big bands and strings. So I didn't really, really advance my piano skills at Leeds. That all happened much earlier. I mean, I'd been playing the piano since I was four years old, Mal and, mm. and Johnny. My dad got us a piano. It was a cheap little five quid piano from the local church. He stripped it down, painted it white. He wanted me to be Liberace, I'm sure. <laughs> and and that's what I learned on. And you'll love this as well. It wouldn't tune up to concert pitch. It would only tune a semitone lower than concert pitch because it was so old. So if I wanted to play along with Elvis Presley records or all the oh, Jeremy Lewis... On I was, the black notes. I was playing on F, in F sharp. Oh, my C gosh. Sharp, in, in flat. <laughs> oh. Wow. So I learned to... I learned to play boogie woogie in F sharp. Oh my goodness oh my me! God. People, no, people don't understand that. That's like that's every it, sharp in the book. It's like oh my gosh! It was like I've got I, every time I have to do something, I press a button, makes it puts it into C. You know, it's a bit Publish. like who is Irving Berlin? He had one. He had a piano and he had a, he had a, sh a shift on it because he could only play in one key. So he used oh to to gosh. change key. He physically had to ch move the keyboard up and down. So I did not know that. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think Stevie Wonder plays on the black notes a lot. I think well, that's, bec that's because of the physicality yeah. of being able to feel the grip. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. uh, if you can do that and then put it on a proper piano, on a proper piano. I mean, it gives you because they are lovely keys, aren't they? If you, if you know how to play in them, um, that's why Stevie Wonder song sounds so great. Exactly, E flat for lovely warm mm. ballads. A flat's a beautiful key. B flat, a lot of jazz is playing. Mm. But F sharp and C sharp, you sort of stay away. <laughs> I actually had to play a song last night in a show that I was a musical that I was doing last night. 
and it and it's a boogie woogie in D flat major. Oh, and, I mean, you know, yeah. the, but there's something about gripping the keys. Mm -hmm. If your hands are sweaty, they can slip off, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so I learned. So when eventually they upgraded the piano when I was about 11 years old and I started proper piano lessons at 11. By that time, I'd learned to play almost everything by ear. Mm -hmm. And um, and at 11, they got me a, a proper piano that would tune. So all of a sudden I was playing in F. And that felt easy. Mm. And G, and mm. that felt easy. And yeah. C, I mean, it's like having played in C sharps and F sharps and, uh, you know, and yeah. A flat. And so that's how my piano playing developed. Obviously, you have a desire to be your own man, you, your own song. So, and you get, <laughs> you get to Opportunity knocks. Born and working, lives in Southampton. Elio draws on his inherited Italian musical flair to present us with one of his own songs, Take You Home. Opportunity knocks now for act number six, Elio Pace. We've been out and about all day since a half past two And driving in my car is not what I plan to do When I think it's time I told you baby black and white I can't believe you'd want to be alone tonight So come on baby let me and oh, of all years to be in the final on Bob Says Opportunity Knocks, there's this bloke from Wales called Mike Doyle. I mean, uh, I, knew, the... I knew my winning my <sighs> winning streak was over as soon as I heard that man sing. Um, <laughs> Mike Doyle, well, we, we, we hit it off straight away. Our love of Elvis Presley matched each other. Um, and we, we, we were, you know, we would rehearse for the show but every opportunity we would find the spare piano and we'd be off singing mm. Elvis Presley songs. We must have gone through the entire repertoire that week. Mike Doyle was amazing. He, uh, I mean, he was amazing. He was not only funny, but he finished his song with Till. Yeah. Till the rivers flow upstream. Yeah. And he hit live, live on BBC television. He hit that top C. Till then I'm yours. B, that's a A. No, he A flat, B flat, C. <laughs> Hey, now here's a little here's a little thing. Uh, uh, Till I think was big big song for Dorothy Squires, Johnny Johnny Tudor. Yeah, well, she had a big hit with it. Yeah, because Johnny Tudor Johnny Tudor used, used, used to live with her. Used to live with with Dorothy Squires. No, 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 not, not like that. Thing. Obviously not oh, like that. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say right. <laughs> Tell us, Johnny. I, I did the Palladium with Dorothy back in the seventies when she made her comeback, and then I did wow. the tour. But we always stayed at her house in Bexley. Because wow. she's like, it was like open house. She'll come and stay with me, you know. Yeah. And oh, you, know, you, you, you were sitting next to, I was sitting next to, um, what was that guy with the fuzzy hair? Um, oh, my God. He, he was out up for murder in America. Um, <laughs> oh, um, Phil uh, Spector. Phil Spector. <laughs> he was sitting next to me. I think it was this boy, it was Phil Spector. <laughs> she knew everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Elia, you, you I mean you've got all these skills, you, you get to that. I mean it's a disappointment when you don't win. Um so, yeah, so, yeah. did you is that when you started working with other people for other people were you able to keep your old solo career going at the same time? I got signed up by a huge huge management company. Now, Johnny, do you remember Anne Murray and no Norman Murray and Norman Anne Chuddy? Murray, yeah, yeah. Do you remember Norman Murray? Yeah. He became my agent after wow. Opportunity Knocks. Now, as you know, at the time, I mean, I don't know, I don't know much about what he did before, but at the time, he was looking after Michael Barrymore. Remember, this is 1988. Mm. This is yeah, the yeah, biggest. Yeah, 235 Regent Street. That's exactly it. And <laughs> it was I remember. The same agent. I had the, didn't have him, but I was in that in that group at the time. That's, well, that's yeah. amazing because I remember at 20 years old going to London, walking down Regent Street, and going into yeah. this incredible building. I was out of my depth. I mean, I was a <laughs> green, naive boy from who brought, brought up in Eastleigh near, yeah, um, in yeah. Hampshire. And I go in and I sign and he's looking after Barrymore, Les Dawson oh, at the time. Yeah. Um, the roly polies. Do you remember the roly polies? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tap dancing. And, and the next thing I know, I'm on BBC television. I'm on Michael Barrymore Saturday night out and flown over to Jersey. I'm on Wogan. Mm -hmm. I did my yeah. first Wogan appearance on his chat show on that Monday, Wednesday, Friday chat show he used to have. I mean, they were, 
I came sixth, but the next thing I know, I'm doing summer seasons with yeah. with uh, Michael supporting Michael Barrymore. I'm on, and then Ronnie Corbett comes along, and I'm and touring with Ronnie Corbett. I mean, it was quite an amazing thing. So, as much as I wanted to, Mal, what you're alluding to, having done my own song on the show, I kept sort of handing over a cassette and going, hey guys, to mm. all Norman and all the people, I've got some more songs, mm-hmm. but they weren't interested. Mm-hmm. They weren't yeah. interested. Mm-hmm. I was getting record deals offered to me by Telstar, okay. KTEL, Elio Pace, winner in brackets, winner of Opportunity Knox, sings the songs of Chuck Berry, sings the song of, of Nat King Cole, sings the songs of Tom Jones. Mm-hmm. And I turned it all down. Even at 2021, 20, I knew... I'm not going down this route. Mm-hmm. I, this no, is not no. the route I wanted. I, I loved the the experience of performing in front of big audiences and television audiences and radio. I mean, I was, you know, Brian Matthews round midnight. I was doing a live session for, it was just quite incredible, but I pulled myself out of it. Mm. I actually cut the strings and, and said, guys, I thank you for everything. But I knew in my heart, I was dying. Mm. I, I thought, this is not the route I wanted. This is early 90s. And so I literally disappeared and took myself off to piano bars in Norway um, just to realign myself and think about everything. And I'd had this incredible two years of national broadcast yeah. fame. Yeah. And what, where I was going, I wanted yeah. to be you, Mal. Oh. <laughs> I you know wanted. The, you know the paradox of this? You were saying about singing your own song, which I can understand. When I did the Canuck Song Festival, I wanted to sing my latest record, which nobody'd heard of because it was brand new, right? So Huey Green says, "No, you've got to do Delilah because everybody knows it." And, I, and in the end, that's what gets the audience going. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. It was almost like I had the gift of hindsight. I thought, "Hold on, if I start becoming this sort of entertainer, I, I'm gonna, I'm never gonna be taken seriously. No one's ever gonna hear my songs. No yeah. one's ever." going to never going to, you know, and I, and I mean it, Mal, what you did as a young man was exactly what I wanted. I wanted to be recognized for my own songs for the, I mean, some of the songs I wrote then have so, have since been covered when I finally got to make my album. They were good songs, but nobody, nobody yeah, wanted, yeah. nobody yeah. was interested. No, I know exactly yeah. that feeling. All right, so you, you know, wait, but you've, you've rediscovered yourself you've and you've reinvented yes. yourself. And that's, you know, that's an incredible inner strength. I, I know, and Johnny and I know from personal experience, because you have these down moments and then you pick yourself up and you've got to this place now. I mean, those connections, you know, the whole thing with Terry Wogan, those, yeah. those programs that you did week in, week out when he wanted a house band, he came to you. And uh, that was Literally. just wonderful, wasn't it? Literally came to me. He called me. It was his son who was at the house. He would had a chat with his dad upstairs and he came down and said, I've just finished talking to my dad and dad wants you to be his musical director. And I said, yes, straight <laughs> away. And then he said, oh, I'm not finished. He said he also is going to push the BBC to make sure that they give you three songs every show to feature as yourself Fantastic. not not just to back all mm. these huge people but he wants to hear you sing he wants to give you this platform i mean i mm. <laughs> you can't pay for that no. you can't no, prepare no. you can't prepare for that i must have done something right for terry i tell you what i, I tell you what it was i think maybe is that he remembered me from 1988 I was this skinny little kid with hair and I did a little medley. Here we go. I did a medley of flip flop and fly one night with you and don't get around much anymore. That was my medley. I wanted to do my own song. Mm -hmm. They weren't interested. Mm -hmm. So Terry really clocked me. And 15 years later, I bumped into him at a corporate do where I was being a dance band and Mm -hmm. just playing stuff for people to dance to. He was one of the guests. He came over and shook my hand and he was like, Nice to see you. I said, yeah, I'm still doing it. Still going. He said, oh, great, great. Then, pure coincidence, that son of his, Mark Wogan, married a girl who had been a backing vocalist a couple of times in my band. By sheer coincidence, she came into the gig and said, oh, I've got a new boyfriend. Who's that? Mark Wogan. I said, Mark Wogan? You mean Terry's son? Yeah. I played for their wedding down at Terry's house. I then played for Terry's other son's wedding. And I think that's where he went. 
this guy is doing a lovely job of being a great wedding singer, but I can do something to help him. And the next thing I know, he's he's played out of the blue one of my recordings of a Delbert McClinton song called Two More Bottles of Wine on his Wake Up to Wogan breakfast show. I didn't have a website. <laughs> this record wasn't even available to the public, but he found it. He'd got it probably via Sue. And he played two more bottles of wine every single week for six months. He would have had to get special permission mm. from somebody or maybe because he's Terry Wogan, he didn't. Mm. But he, I remember him saying at the beginning of that first play, now oh, I'm going to play you. Uh, somebody you don't ever hear on the radio, but this guy and his wonderful band travel up and down the country, making thousands of people happy, playing for all sorts of events, but you never hear him on the radio. We're going to rectify that. Here's two more bottles of wine by Elio Pace. We came out west together with a common desire The fever we had might have set the west coast on fire Two months late I got trouble in mind As Jenny moved out she left me behind But it's alright cause it's midnight I've got two more bottles of wine Okay, so that that's all happening. Um, I mean, this whole thing about play, playing a songbook, which which is what this current tour is, has been about. How did you? How did you? Did you fall into that? Was that one of one of your plans to be, you know, to do the Billy Joel songbook? Because he's, you know, I saw him in I saw him in uh, I think Edinburgh, or in Glasgow. It was fantastic. And now he does a local gig, doesn't he? He does the Madison Square Garden once a month. <laughs> yeah, his local know, gig. Local yeah, gig. His local um, pub, yeah. You know, so it's hard to see him. So to find somebody who can play those songs, play them well with a great band. Wh- whose idea yeah. was it? I fell in love with Billy Joel's music in the middle of the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, I was 16, 17 years old or something. And I just absolutely fell in love with this guy's music. I heard a song called This Night from the Innocent Man album. Mm-hmm. And that beautiful soaring chorus, which melody was written by Beethoven. And I just remember thinking this song is just so amazing. And I fell in love with the music. And I, at that point, in 1987, 88-ish, I was thinking, apart from Billy, mm. there's no one else singing Billy Joel songs. So I started doing these weddings and I threw Teller About It in Uptown Girl. The River of Dreams comes out in 93. I threw that into my set. And I always, always hoped that one day I would be able to do a whole evening. I don't know, maybe I'd organise it myself mm. and I'd invite some friends and sing all these brilliant songs. I waited for 30 years. Talk. I went 30 years because I, I actually tried a couple of times. Laurie Mansfield, do you remember Laurie Mansfield? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who was there in the same building that you're talking about That's there. Right. Yeah, yeah. He international was man- artist. International artist. He managed That's Jim it. Davidson and he managed Ronnie Corbett. And I, because I was working with Ronnie Corbett, Laurie Mansfield had seen me. I called him up one day and I said, Laurie, can I come into your office? I want to pitch you an idea. And I went into there and I said, look, nobody is performing Billy Joel songs. Nobody. And tribute bands weren't a thing at this point. And I said, I don't want to dress up, but I just want to sing the songs and tell the story. I, I, I did a whole presentation for him about an hour at his offices. And he said, this is brilliant, but you're 20 years too early. And he almost to the month, he was exactly right. To the day that we started the Billy Joel songbook in March 2014. Goodness. It's my passion because I truly believe, I truly believe, present company excluded, he is the greatest singer-songwriter of all time. I was was mistaken for him once in a taxi. Were you? (laughs) Because I had black hair in those days, the big leather jacket. I can see it. And I'm in New York and the guy says, you Billy Joel? I said, (laughs) (laughs) don't we all? (laughs) The other thing that's been happening, Mal and Johnny, is that because of the success of the commerciality of the Billy Joel songbook, which are all the hits, Mm -hmm. I mean, about 30 songs and, you know, about 25 of them were top 40 hits. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's incredible. Um, People were saying, can't you do this song? Can't you do that song? There's no space to put it into a songbook show like that. So we started doing albums in their entirety, one in each half. In 2018, we did Glass Houses and Innocent Man. 2019, we did Stormfront and The Stranger. There's 12 of them to do. So I'm going to finish the set. We've recorded every show. So I'm going to release a, a box set of the Billy Joel songbook 
album show live in about three years time. What's beautiful about it is one day I had a brainwave. I went, because I was contacted by a guy called David Brown, who was Billy Joel's lead guitar player from 1978 to 91. He plays on everything from my life to We Didn't Start the Fire, wow. right? Uptown Girl, still rock and roll to me. Dum, 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 dum. That's him. Contacted me via messenger, having seen a couple of videos. Hey, hey, man, I really like what you're doing with Billy's music. If ever you're in the States, look me up. Give us a call. Be nice to hang out. You know, I called him. I said, David, how do you fancy coming to Britain and being part of an album show? And he said, yes. Wow. And so we've had him in the band and he's coming back in March where we're going to pick up because of the pandemic. We canceled two tours, but we're back in March. We're coming to Newport at the Riverfront Theatre oh, yeah. yeah. to do Street Life Serenade oh, and oh. Uh, 52nd Street. My favourites. Those are my 50, 50 seconds. Really? Yeah, I loved, I loved, loved them. Loved them, loved them, loved them. Still got them on violin you're, in the corner of the studio here. You're on the guest list, Mel. You're right, on the, the guest look, list. Look, uh, we're really looking forward to it. Johnny's my date. Yeah. He's, Johnny's my plus Congrats. one. I, I'm, his, I'm his plus one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, we're going to play out with a little bit more from the concert, but uh, I'll joy to speak to you. And what, what I think is, you know, if you're still doing gigs with people that you were doing gigs with 20, 30 years ago, you must be an all right guy because you don't ah. want to work with people who were bad in the past. So there we are. There must be something about you, Elio, that, uh, that's, that's pretty special. Well, that's, that's very lovely of you to yeah. say. Um, I'm, I surround myself with very, very talented people. As somebody once said, rem rem surround yourself with people who are more talented than you. And I and I think I have. Brilliant. And uh, and they've they become my best friends. The guys on stage you will see on Friday our mates who I would invite to my house yeah. to have dinner. That's you know. brilliant. Uh, so well, it's, that. well, I, this is what we do at the end of every show. We say it's goodbye from uh, him. And it's grazie tanto from me. Hey, and from oh. El Elio, Elio Pace. Hey, arrivederci. Ciao. Arrivederci. Ciao, ragazzi. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. ciao. ciao bello. Ciao. Ciao bello. <laughs>